on Asia today. We will begin in Manila this hour. That's where the Philippine President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo has made an impassioned plea for unity as she seeks to effect change on what she called a country poised for takeoff. President Arroyo outlined the case for political reform in the State of the Nation address just about 30 minutes ago. Mrs. Arroyo wants to take the Philippines away from presidential system of government to a parliamentary one, asking for fundamental change in the system as soon as possible. Mrs. Arroyo plugged a constituent assembly and unveiled plans to uh, change the presidency to parliamentary system. Well, looking sober, the president also highlighted some of the strong points of her administration, touting the economic successes. To back this up, Ms. Arroyo cited the four million jobs generated in the last four years, improvement in tax collections, infrastructure and housing for the urban poor. She also referred to uh, the cutting in half of the drug menace and the fact that kidnappings have now all but disappeared. She also hailed the abatement of the southern insurgency, saying peace in southern Mindanao is now within reach. But moving on to a national security issue, Mrs. Arroyo also urged the swift passage of an anti-terrorism law. She uh, never directly referred to the crisis that has sparked mass recalls for her resignation, though. Mrs. Arroyo ended her speech asking the country to unite for the good, despite past divisiveness. Well, we're going to Manila right now for more on President Arroyo's State of the Nation uh, speech with Channel News Asia's Philippine Bureau Chief Twink Makaraig standing by with us. Twink, can you uh, tell us more about this uh, very uh, special speech, I guess I would say, for Mrs. Arroyo's political life? You know, Tim, the consensus that's emerged, I think, from these weeks of crisis, the dueling street demonstrations, the exhaustion of the phenomenon of people power, the spectacle of, you know, legislation paralyzed by self-serving inquiries in Congress, and the apparent weaknesses of our institutions and the corruption of our processes is that a profound systemic change is badly needed by this country, uh, much more than a uh, mere change in leadership. And President Arroyo said that she would see this with a historic change in the form and system of government a parliamentary federal government by a charter change. Thank you very much, Twink, for that. Twink Makareg live with us there from Manila. Also with us in studio this afternoon is Ms. Amina Rasul Bernardo, a former cabinet secretary and the former president, Fidel Ramos's uh, administration. Uh, thank you again for joining us here. Uh, and thank Ms. you Rasul for Bernardo. asking me back. Here. All right, first of all, let's talk about the, uh, the point there that Twink brought up about not having an alternative as a leader for the Philippines. You are a member of the United Opposition. What do you think about that? Is there another person who can take over the leadership of the country? Well, definitely. I mean, if we are going to do the quick and dirty um, uh, way out, uh, so to speak, if she steps down, then the vice president becomes president. And this is the route that Mrs. Arroyo herself took when they unceremoniously kicked out uh, former President Estrada from Malacanang. However, there are people who are uncomfortable with the vice president assuming the presidency. And there are also calls for Vice President uh, De Castro to step down together with Ms. Arroyo, in which case part of the process is for the Senate president to take over the presidency, and then there will be snap elections, in which case you're going to now have a, a new leadership in, uh, in Malacanang. And then the scenario goes go into uh, charter change. However, there are groups now who are saying this is not enough because if we, there will be an, a snap election, what's going to happen is the same old dominant forces, the traditional political forces, are still going to control the uh, transition, the charter change move. So what they are proposing is a caretaker government, and it's been called by various names, but essentially they want to empower a group of leaders who represent significant blocks of uh, the electorate to come together, become a council or a government, and lead the Philippines through a transition into the next uh, political system, which we hope is going to be more uh, federal form of a government than what we have now, a presidential system, American style, that really just caters to the needs of uh, 
the central government. All right, since you brought it up, the charter change, do you think Filipinos understand what this is all about and are they ready for such a change? I think more and more they're beginning to understand. Maybe it has not permeated through the mass base, but let's put it this way. 20 years ago, there was already talk about federalism, especially for provinces in Mindanao, which are so far away from, uh, from Imperial Manila. And over time, more and more of the local government executives are beginning to understand uh, what they gain and what they will lose if we have such a system. And more and more of them are beginning to agree that perhaps we should have a change in government. And if we can bring in the local government executives into this debate, if we bring the leaders of civil society into this debate and the leaders of business sector, the religious sector, then that is the mass that you need to really come up with the discussions and come up with the structures that will work. And then you bring it to the mass base. You will have a referendum. We will ask our people, do you agree? Do you disagree? Now, it's been talked about for a long time, charter change yes. even before, uh, during President uh, Ramos's time. What is taking so long? Why isn't there a process to actually put this uh, going until now? During the time of President Ramos, many well, many political leaders thought that this was uh, President Ramos's way of staying in power. So they masked and prevented the Charter Change Initiative from uh, succeeding. During the time of President Estrada, well, you know what happened to that the presidency. It was cut short. Mrs. Arroyo stepped in. We thought Mrs. Arroyo would start uh, the initiative to discuss Charter Change because that is very much a... Uh, key theme of the uh, Lakas party, of which I am, by the way, a founding member. But she did not. And it is only now when her presidency, when her seat is at risk, that she has come back to charter change. And many of us see that perhaps this is her way out of the predicament that she is in, instead of being a political vision the way it was for President Ramos and the way it is for Speaker de Venezia. So how will uh, this though prolong her power in the government if, if indeed charter change takes place or is implemented? I think the, the um, strategy here is that people will gravitate towards the need to have the discussion on charter change, that political parties will support this and therefore the support for her resignation or her impeachment will die down. Unfortunately, that might not really work because the move for her resignation or impeachment is really being driven outside of the political circles. They're being driven by civil society, by religious groups, not the politicians who were there in Congress applauding Mrs. Arroyo 32 times. All right, okay, one last thing that pretty much everyone is interested in, Will she survive her presidency after today's speech? The, well, put it this way, there are bets being taken all over uh, the Philippines now about not whether she's going to stay, but how long she's going to stay. And right. I'm not a betting man, so don't ask me for my bet. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Amina Rasul Bernardo there joining us live here to uh, look at what the president said in her 2005 State of the Nation uh, address. Well, we just heard there the Philippine president delivering her address, a speech billed as the biggest of her career, to a standing ovation from lawmakers. Her supporters, of course, Mrs. Arroyo says, it's time to start the great debate on charter change, backing a shift to parliamentary government. She also stressed it is time to change the political system, and the sooner this is done, the better it is for the country. The president also touted the economic success of her administration. She says the drug menace has been cut in half, kidnappings are a thing of the past, insurgencies have abated, and she says 80% of the peace talks have been completed, and permanent peace in Mindanao is within reach. She also referred to her struggle to get rid of debt, calling fiscal reform a titanic struggle. She invited lawmakers even to send a strong message to investors that they will not waver from economic reform, whatever the political cost may be. Other stories making headlines this Monday. The United States and North Korea have held a rare meeting on the eve of the resumption of six-way talks on Pyongyang's nuclear program. America's point man on the issue say both sides were just trying to get acquainted and they were comparing notes. Well, uh, the focus there, uh, obviously it has nothing to do with uh, 
any um, negotiation. We're just going to uh, get acquainted. Hong Kong is on alert as authorities in southwestern China investigate a mysterious disease. It has killed 17 farm workers in Sichuan province and left at least 12 others critically ill. The victims had reportedly handled sick or dead livestock. Health officials in China say the deaths are not caused by SARS. They think it's likely to be a bacteria that spread among pigs. That's the latest from our newsroom. I'm Timothy Goh. Thanks for watching. We're crossing over again to uh, Timothy Go, who is at the Nickel Highway Collapse site for some updates. Tim. All right, hopefully you can hear me better now. As I was saying, I'm just about an arm's length away from where the collapse happened two days ago. And as I was saying, about 32 hours after that happened, uh, rescue workers pulled off the body of a second man yet to be identified. It's being fingerprinted as we speak. Uh, the body was found underneath water, uh, stuck under a truck, as far as I understand. Now, uh, I was explaining earlier as to why it's taking so long to locate uh, the missing uh, people in here. It is because the containers are on top of each other on an equilibrium. Rescue workers are told to be very careful not to disrupt that equilibrium or else others uh, will start caving in again and falling down and that will make rescue efforts uh, a little bit harder to do. As far as we know right now, manual search continues. Uh, life detection uh, devices were deployed overnight, but so far, no signs of life. Jenny? Thanks. Let's talk to Timothy Goh, who's at the side. Tim, what's being done to continue the search efforts? Well, of course, Jenny, as we know, the search for uh, the missing person, the one remaining missing person, hasn't stopped since uh, Tuesday afternoon when it started. So rain or shine, night or day, the search will continue for Mr. Hing. Of course, that is unless uh, lives of rescuers are put in any uh, sort of danger. Jenny? Okay. Yesterday, Mr. Hing's family visited the site twice. Do you know if they provided the rescuers with any more information to help pinpoint his location? Well, Mr. Heng's brother was here late last night and apparently had told uh, the SCDF commissioner as to where he thinks um, his brother might have been during the, uh, the collapse. So right now I was told that about 30 rescuers separated into three teams are working on those uh, particular areas, uh, uh, quite a big vicinity there. Uh, one team is working under murky waters and all they can do is touch and feel their way through uh, the water down there. Um, the other two teams are tunneling their way because there is a possibility that Mr. Hank could be uh, buried about 30 meters deep into uh, the, the tunneling operation uh, down here. Jenny? All right, what's the next phase of the operations? The next phase, of course, is uh, using machines, heavy machinery and equipment to start lifting things uh, off the ground. But uh, the decision on the cut and lift operation has yet to be made. And at the moment, the SEDF Commissioner James Tan is meeting with LTA uh, authorities as well as engineers to see uh, when they can start doing this. Channel News Asia's Timothy Go joins me now from the Raffle City Convention Center. Timothy, it appears that terrorism was a concern for IOC members as New York made its bid. It is uh, very much a concern, Chloe. Let me just point out that the uh, New York delegation is now making their way for the press conference just behind me here. And any moment, we might see some of the celebrities and big-name people walking past right behind me. Now, as for terrorism, it is a big concern, of course. Uh, a question was raised over uh, athletes that will be admitted to the United States to New York City if in case New York wins the 2012 uh, Olympic Games. Uh, and we heard Mayor Michael Bloomberg saying every athlete, every coach, every sports official will be welcome welcome in New York City. Now some would say the Big Apple shouldn't be uh, planning uh, a game that will give terrorists a seven year stretch to plan any sort of attack and therefore the, the Olympic Games shouldn't be held in New York City. But others may say the international community must give New York a vote of confidence, a vote of solidarity, especially right after 9-11 uh, in 2001 when the rest of the world was actually infected, uh, affected by that uh, event. Chloe? Now, Tim, what about other, some other, tell us about some of the highlights that you thought were uh, reflected New York pretty much. Well, the biggest highlight as far as I'm concerned, Chloe, is the fact that New York tried to show the city as the world city. In fact, they said every single country participating in the Summer Olympic Games will have a home field advantage if the games are held in New York. 
That's because New York houses a lot of different cultures, nationalities. We saw it in the video. We saw how different people welcoming uh, the delegates here of the IOC into New York in their very own language. So every country does indeed probably have a whole field advantage in New York. Now, the one other issue that was brought up is public support, which is a key factor in deciding uh, an Olympic city that will host the Olympic Games. Now, New York, the latest figures I have right now stands at 59% of New Yorkers actually want the Games to be held in their city. Now, this is not good enough. The IOC wants something 66% or above to be uh, considered a popular Games. Now, all across America, only 54% of Americans actually do care about New York hosting the Olympic Games. Uh, other highlights, uh, Chloe, we can talk about New York's plan of having an, a giant X shape running across the five boroughs of New York uh, with the centerpiece being the Athlete Village and the Olympic Stadium. Of course, we've heard about the Olympic Stadium now being moved to the bor borough of Queens instead of uh, the west side of Manhattan. Also important to think, Chloe, when it comes to voting time, New York may be an underdog now, but don't rule it out because if New York does stay in the final three, some European cities might actually vote for New York because if Paris wins this time around, no other European city will be able to host the next Olympic Games after that, which will be in 2016. So it will be in their interest to actually vote for New York this time around, let New York host 2012, and then let another European city host the 2016 Olympic Games. That's Chloe? a good way of uh, putting it, Tim. But uh, speaking of underdogs, history has shown that underdogs actually can prevail. And another underdog in this bid race is Moscow. And what do you think it will take for Moscow to actually swing the votes toward its way? And Moscow is next up. In well, its Moscow, presentation. Moscow is next in the presentation. Of course, uh, there was a spokesman from the Moscow delegation bid yesterday who said that it was only the Western media who was putting Moscow down because the Western media actually believed the Moscow bid or the Moscow proposal is quite strong. And in fact, it is because uh, Moscow's concept is actually holding the games in, in a river, uh, along the river. It's a 10 kilometer, every venue will be 10 kilometers away from each other. Most of the venues are there already. As you remember, Moscow hosted the 1980 Olympic Games, which was boycotted by the Western powers. Also, Moscow has Vladimir Putin, who will be addressing the, uh, the delegations a little bit later on when they make their presentations. All right, Timothy, working very hard there at the Raffle City Convention Center. Good to see you again. Now, Tim, from magic to reality, which uh, Madrid says is the tenet of its proposal. Now, Madrid is next to present what is, would you say, is its weakest point as a city vying for the 2012 honors? Well, initially, Madrid's uh, weakest point would be the housing. It, it lacks hotels in and around the proposed Olympic venue. Uh, but according to Madrid's bid chief, Feliciano Mayoral, this is a very, very minor uh, setback for the Madrid bid, and it can easily be improved. The IOC requires at least 40,000 uh, rooms, hotel rooms, for uh, Olympic uh, bid hosts. Of course, what Madrid has, a secret weapon, perhaps you can say, is Juan Antonio Samaranch, which is the IOC's former uh, president who's been leading the IOC for the last 20 years. Now, he wanted Beijing, he got Beijing. He wanted Athens, he got Athens. He wanted Atlanta, he got Atlanta. And now he wants Madrid. Will he get Madrid? We'll have to find out later on this afternoon, Mel. Well, thanks a lot for that, Tim. We'll find out, I guess, in about three hours. Well,